According to the best of my ability, so help me God. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. And moving along, we have our medical director, Dr. Bob Lahita. Left hand on the Bible, left hand. Raise your right hand. That's it. I, and you state your name. I, Dr. Bob Lahita. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. The Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. And I will faithfully, partially, and justly. Perform all of the duties of the Office of Medical Director of EMS. Perform all of the duties as Medical Director of EMS. According to the best of my abilities, so help me God. According to the best of my abilities, so help me God. Congratulations. And finally, we have the Volunteer EMS Coordinator and Division Commander of Special Operations, Will Kivit. I, I, take, I take special pleasure in swearing Will in. He is a very special guy, and we're very fortunate to have him leading this group. Come on over. Raise your right hand, please. Say, I, and you state your name. I, William Kivit. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey, and the Constitution of the State of New Jersey, and that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly, and that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly, perform all of the duties of the Office of Volunteer EMS Coordinator, perform all the duties of Volunteer EMS Coordinator, and Division Commander of Special Operations, and Division Commander of Special Operations. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. Help me God. Congratulations. Thank you so much.
they're leaving. <laughs> oh well. That was so nice. Okay, now we're going to take comments from the public, uh, which lasts 40 minutes, but we will likely go over. And I ask, as I always do, bring your passion, bring your criticism, bring your respect. And let's begin. Mike Rohan, could you check to see if the mic is on? There's a little green light. At the bottom. Press the button. And the green light, is the green light on? Green light is on. Good. Can you hear and me? if you could just speak closely. Everyone, if you could speak closely into the mic, this way we can all hear you. Okay. Rohan De Silva, 521 West Saddle River Road. I'm here today to read a letter on behalf of my neighbor, Mr. Donald Henke, who's at 524 West Saddle River Road. But before I read that letter, I'd like, I'd like to thank you for observing all these other uh, cancer-related health issues. Thank you very much. Let's hope that the people of the West Saddle River Road community don't need you to stand up in a few years and set things for us and our health because of the issues with Shedler. Now, on to the letter for, uh, from Mr. Henke. A letter to the village council, mayor and council members. The fact that the council is allegedly pursuing outside council makes it apparent that most members of this council have already made up their minds to try to defy Shippo. <coughs> you continue to pursue the option of a very large multi-use field over the alternative, a more sensible park the one previously already agreed upon. The park would serve fewer sport teams, but would better serve the whole community, a community of Ridgewood residents from every part of the village. Shedler Park would be used by our residents 12 months a year, 12 to 15 hours a day, 365 days per year. Use by sports groups would be considerably less, accounting for school hours, inclement weather, and unsuitable field conditions use of sport fields in winter would be negligible. With minimal expense, we could enjoy games of cards, dominoes, chess, checkers, bocce, horseshoes, shuffleboard, badminton, volleyball, yoga, tai chung, and tai chi, painting, even just a stroll through the park with baby carriages, walking our dogs, sitting and talking with new friends and neighbors. This would provide a therapeutic service both physically, mentally, and emotionally. This is a therapy that is often overlooked, but is something that we all need. It is called care of the soul. It's unquantifiable. We sometimes don't realize that it's missing in our lives, but when we find it, we feel its healing effects. The COVID ep epidemic, sorry, has ex exacerbated this problem with us and the only cure f is for us to reconnect with nature and other people. A park is a community meeting space, a place where this therapeutic healing would happen. Don't lose this opportunity to make this a park. That is a healing place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Hi, good evening. Uh, Leo Ruan, 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Good evening, Leo. Hi, hi, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I want to, this evening, um, address that the local community is not in favor of a larger Could field. Could I have you speak a little louder, please? Sorry, yes. If you just move the microphone closer, it would be better. Um, I would like to state that the community is not in favor of a larger field. Uh, we would like to have a smaller field that was proposed after years of compromise and debate. Uh, tonight, um, I have tra has traffic safety been adequately studied? Um, if we have 
a larger field, it will be open to high school and adult games. And anyone in the state of New Jersey, and perhaps even uh, New York State who wants to use our field. So this large field would now mean that there would be a lot of busing involved from uh, travel teams. Uh, this would also introduce lots more cars because individual uh, players, referees, um, spectators would be now joining to watch these larger adult uh, games that would be available. Uh, if um, the adult feed would probably mean later games as well, so there'll be very much limited visibility. Um, I want to also bring up the question of a traffic study, because there was a traffic study done in 2015, but did this adequately uh, prepare for large coaches and buses that would now be coming into the community because of this large adult field? It's important to remember that a scheduler is off an exit of Route 17. People race around um, the coming off that highway, they race around like it's a Formula One or a rally. They come so fast. You know, I wouldn't like any kids or anybody to get hurt by uh, drivers coming in too fast. Last weekend, um, I don't know if you've seen on social media, uh, there was a couple of large buses, lots of cars on either side of the road. It only left about 10 feet. This would stop any emergency personnel trying to come to an accident because it was so bad. Uh, lastly, on West Siddler River Road, uh, it's the only, West Siddler Road is the only exit for a bunch of circular roads and cul-de-sacs opposite the park. Anybody from Kingsbridge, Tarhoon, uh, Kenwood, Chelsea Place, Better Court, can only exit onto West Siddler River Road. There isn't a different um, exit or entry point to it. There is only one. So uh, I, I would like that there would be a better traffic study done uh, just to make sure that uh, anything that's proposed is safe. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. Jacqueline Home, 30 Carriage Lane. Good evening, Jackie. Hi. I live in the Shedler neighborhood and do not support a large turf field. I urge the council to do its due diligence and conduct impact studies, health, environmental, traffic, safety, independent studies done by experts. I want to read from a letter that was written to the village council from Brooke De Lynch on the topic, playing fields near busy highways pose risks for youth athletes. Ms. Lynch is Executive Director of Moms Team Institute of Youth Sports Safety and Project Director of Smart Teams Play Safe. In her letter, she states, before your community decides to locate playing fields near a busy highway, you may want to consider these serious facts. The American Academy of Pediatrics concluded that exposure to traffic-related pollution, such as exhaust emissions from cars and diesel exhaust from trucks and even school buses, increases a child's risk of respiratory complications as well as a lifetime risk of cancer. A substantial and growing body of scientific evidence has linked airborne toxic pollution for motor vehicles, trains, and aircraft to significant health problems, especially in children including aggravated asthma, chronic bronchitis, reduced lung function, irregular heartbeat, heart attacks and premature death in people with heart or lung disease. Recent studies warn that the developing lungs of children may be especially vulnerable to adverse consequences of particulate inhalation and that exercise in high ambient particle conditions may increase the risk of lung and vascular damage. In 2006, in the journal Inhalation Toxicology, found that levels of ambient air pollution at athletic fields located adjacent to major highways were several fold higher than levels measured at fields located in rural areas. 
The same study also found that fields close to major highways expose children to level of ambient ozone above levels shown to cause airway inflammation, abnormal lung function, and asthma exacerbation, with the highest levels in the warmer afternoons when games and practices are held and traffic is at its peak. I'd also like to say the members of the public were asked to speak with respect. I ask that the council lead by example. I was taken aback when the mayor started before public comment walking away from the proclamations stating the rest of the evening won't be much fun. That was poor. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, good evening, Robert Koch, 60 North Hillside Place. Good evening, Robert. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to mention that throughout my adventures on the uh, captivating YouTube channel, Ridgewood Town Council meetings, I noted the uh, steady presence of um, village manager Heather Melander and village attorney Matt Rogers, and I wanted to thank both of them uh, for their incredible commitment to public service. Uh, there are about 250 episodes of Ridgewood Village Council, and Attorney Rogers, I think he appears on every single one of them. So that's amazing. And I think you have a great future, future ahead of you as an emerging, emerging star on uh, the Municipal Adventures Network. Um, anyway, what I really want to talk about is I want to talk about, sum up the Shedler deliberations about the legal perspective of the concept of preemptive authority. So the legal doctrine of pre, uh, preemption refers to the idea that a higher authority of law will displace the law of a lower authority of law when the two authorities come into a conflict. The village of Ridgewood, count, the Ridgewood Council does not have the final authority over the design of the Shedler Park. Ultimate authority over Shedler, as we all know, rests with the New Jersey State Historic Preservation Office, which is a division of the New Jersey Department of Ed Environmental Protection. Anything the town does is subject to the preemption of the SHPO. It is really a shame that the new council has squandered 64 days entertaining pie-in-the-sky designs for Shedler as if Ridgewood has a final authority on this. It's really a shame that false hope has been given to a vision of a sports complex for Shedler when, in fact, the council has no ability to, to deliver that vision. There is zero, repeat, zero probability that SHPO will approve a sports complex. Sports complex, historic preservation, they seem like diametrically opposed concepts. So why waste so much time? Why waste so much political capital? Why waste so much political goodwill? Why waste so much village resources on a design that is dead on arrival with SHPO? So I suggest going with Resolution 18-36, let us not talk falsely now. The hour is getting late. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I just want to mention, as we do, uh, as is our custom, we're going to take the first 10 people from the audience uh, for public comment, and then we're going to go to our hybrid access people. So um, Robert was the fourth person in line. Continue. Cynthia O'Keefe, 542 West Saddle River Road. Thank you for the opportunity to let me speak this evening. Good evening, Cynthia. I'd like to state that I, along with many of my neighbors who are here this evening, are in favor of a small grass field. And I believe this was the intended design that was uh, approved in 2018, that we do not in any way endorse a full-size regulation sports complex with a turf field. And there are many reasons for this. As many of the neighbors have already expressed at a number of village council workshops and council meetings, we are concerned over the serious implications that can and will likely affect our health and our safety of our neighborhood, as well as environmental impact uh, based on development changes. And last but not least, the historic preservation of the Shedler property. As was pre pre presented in prior meetings, turf fields, we all know, are made of various chemicals and plastics. Studies have shown that synthetic turf fields contain PFAS. We talked about that last week at the workshop. And other chemicals have been shown to cause cancer, and this has been acknowledged by the Center for Disease Control 
and the EPA. So there are studies out there. Our home is located within a very close proximity to the Shedler land. And what concerns us is there are other families with very young kids and also seniors, and we all use well water on these properties, okay? So we live there, we drink the water, we use the water to bathe, we use the water for our washing. We use this well water. If there is a turf field on that land, we are very concerned that these chemicals will get into that water. This is a disaster waiting to happen. So these wells are not a far distance from the, from the site of the proposed field. And if we're talking about, a, you know, we, we all want to have outdoor space and we want to have a field for children to play. That is everyone's goal here. And we all listened to the young children speak last week and gave their impassioned pleas about how they want their field of dreams. We would like that too, but within certain ramifications. There are going to be many things that can happen to the people who live in this neighborhood if a turf field, along with all the particulates and chemicals and other things coming off the roadway that can affect the health and safety of our neighbors and ourselves. So we know that some of these materials that will be on the ground can, uh, you know, the particles from these toxic chemicals and dangerous plastics will likely be absorbed into the soil and the groundwater beneath the surface. So that's number one. So I think the time is now that we have a call to action and that we need to take serious consideration of our most basic need for the people who are living directly within close proximity of this neighborhood who are using this well water. So I'd like to ask the council for your special consideration. What assurances can you provide that our water will be safe for consumption? And will any studies be conducted to ensure that the safety and well-being of our neighborhood remains intact? So I thank you for your time and attention, and I think this is a very serious matter that we're all concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Hold on a second. Are we going to have fun now? No? <laughs> Hi, my name is Linda Koch, 60 North Hillside Place. And hello, greetings to the council, your honor, good evening to fellow residents of Ridgewood and my friends, neighbors watching this. I'm here to talk about a small neighborhood in Ridgewood. Where the Glen School is, uh, unfortunately, when it was closed, the kids had to be bused to school. My kids didn't. These kids didn't have a playground to play on, and still don't. My kids did. Do yours? A little history. In this neighborhood, a little piece of property that the village of Ridgewood brought with grant money based on its historical importance. I'm going to call this Shedler Park. Finally, a place where the kids can play. But this has become a hot button issue. A little more history. This property has been the scene of many battles, and I'm not talking about Revolutionary War stuff. There are artifacts, super cool, but I'm talking about heated debates over what to do with this land. Now, I don't know the whole history of this, but I can say that in 2017, a group of folks representing all different points of view formed an ad hoc committee, and after two years of skirmishes, <laughs> they came to a truce, and they came up with a plan. Beautifully landscaped walking paths, playground for the kids, and a ballpark. Not a biggie big, but a mama bear size, just right for that piece of property. And it was passed by a previous sitting council. Sounds great, but here we are today, many years later, no park, no playground, no field. And why is this newly seated council deciding to reopen this, to perhaps rescind this most equitable plan, throwing away years of work? Some may see this as a bowl field issue, but I don't see it that way. To me, this is a moral dilemma of doing what's right, what's fair, more promises were made, campaign promises. And I was taught that keeping one's word is a badge of honor, marks one's integrity. So to all my Ridgewood folks out there, maybe it's not in your backyard, but who's to say it won't be next? Thank you, Linda. Good evening, my name is uh, Joe DeMarco. I'm a resident at 572 West Saddle River Road. To reiterate, I support the development of a multi-use park, including a small grass field, children's playground, passive area, including walking paths. This development would not only be great, of great value to the whole Ridgewood community, but to the surrounding neighborhood families. I have several concerns regarding the development of the Shedler property but I would like to uh, speak tonight regarding the development of a full-size field with artificial turf. As a father uh, of children who play sports and a physician, 
I would like to bring to your attention an alarming safety issue concern um, for our children. Turf fields may look nice and require less maintenance, but research has shown that these fields are more dangerous to our children to play on, resulting in higher non-contact injury rate and higher risk of concussions. Last week, on behalf of myself and other concerned community members, I asked that the appropriate studies be performed to determine the impact of the proposed field changes on health, safety, traffic, and environment. But we were, have been told that further studies are not the intention of this council. So allow me to present some of the research to you, for you tonight. I am happy to provide these articles for further review. A meta-analysis in the American Journal of Sports Medicine of 53 articles uh, published between 1972 and 2020 found a higher rate of foot and ankle injuries on artificial turf compared to natural grass. Another recent article from 2022 in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine compared over 1,000 ACL injuries among high school um, athletes participating in football and soccer. They found that ACL injuries were more likely to occur on artificial turf than natural glass. If you don't want to listen to scientists, then listen to our country's professional athletes. Nick Bosa, a 49 years defender, is a strong opponent of playing on artificial turf. He himself sustained the ACL tear playing on artificial turf at MetLife Stadium in 2020. He said, and I quote, when you're young and in high school and college and you think turf is fast and fun and it looks good, and then you realize after a few years it's like, whew, I'll do anything to get on some grass. A recent statement by the NFL Players Association reports that players had a 28% higher rate of non-contact lower extremity injuries when playing on artificial turf. The NFLPA has called for an immediate replacement and ban from the turf fields. If professional athletes are demanding organizations to prohibit turf fields, why would we subject our children to what professionals have deemed uh, as hazardous. Um, for these reasons, um, I believe it would be prudent to not add another turf field in Ridgewood for the safety of our children. Please consider data carefully um, when making your final decision on the development plan. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Dana Glazer, 61 Clinton Avenue. Um, I'm here this evening in support of my neighbors, our neighbors at Shedler. And, and I say our neighbors because I think it's important to think of them as, as, as if they live next to us. Dana, could yes. you move the microphone a little closer to you with the mask? It's just need you. Is that better? Much better. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm going to make be very brief this evening. Uh, in 2017, there was a resolution to create a reasonable playing field at Shuttler. Uh, and I, I just don't understand why that is not being put into place because that was done with the agreement and cooperation with the Shuttler residents who this is going to be most impacted. Uh, on top of that, there are no impact studies that I hear of, which is, I, I just can't understand that. Uh, the historical aspect of that, of that area is important. It's been designated as such. Uh, I've heard, I'm not, this isn't confirmed to me, but I, my understanding is that there's going to be some trying to, try to re revoking of that designation. Uh, if that's correct, that's a really bad look for Ridgewood, particularly as we're heading towards America 250. Um, there were a lot of uh, uh, little leaguers who were here last week and I think that's wonderful that they came up and that they want to have a, a field to play in. Um, but I think that the lesson of, well, we're going to go and do this big thing uh, against the, the residents who live there is, is kind of a, a might versus right kind of lesson. And I don't think that that's what we want to be teaching our kids. And so as much as I think that it's important that they have a field there, I think something that's more moderate and that goes back to that 2017 resolution is really the way to go. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dana. 
My name is Christina Million. I live at 530 West Saddle River Road. I'm in support of a small grass field. Um, my kids couldn't make it tonight, so they wanted me to ask the council a few questions on their behalf regarding the extended field. Question one for my daughter. She wanted to know why the council is not looking into the available property by the park and ride located on Route 17 South as a home for the extended field option. She mentioned it comes with lights already installed. It's a bigger field than Shedler. It's not on historic ground. And parents who commute into the city could easily attend any game. Question two, when acres of trees are removed for the expanded sports field, my son asked if he'll be at a higher risk of recurrent wheezing and asthma due to highway pollution. Question three, my daughter asked me if the increased traffic to our neighborhood would mean that she can no longer safely ride her bike on West Saddle River Road. And then she followed up to say if she did get hurt, could emergency vehicles reach her in time or would they be stuck in a bottleneck by the field? My son loves to fish. He asked if the Saddle River will become contaminated by the future storm runoff caused by the expanded blacktop parking lot in those CAD drawings. And question six, if the expanded sports field moves forward, my son wanted to know when he goes over to Matt Rossi's house to play with his kids, can he drink Matt's tap water since he's on private well, or will his water make the kids in the neighborhood sick? You know, my son's too little to watch Aaron Brockovich, but maybe we all need to start rewatching that film. I'd appreciate having answers to my kids' questions. As a parent, it's incredibly alarming at how much we do not know what this extended field will do in practice to our neighborhood and our kids' safety. And quite honestly, I feel like the East Ridgewood children are often forgotten in this debate, and I think that's shameful, because the children who live on the east side of Ridgewood their physical health and safety. These are not just our talking points here. It is the entire point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. This is our 10th commenter. Um, after this, we will go to um, our hybrid access people. And if we have time, we'll return to uh, people in the audience. Good evening. Elizabeth Yastrzemska to 15 Walton Street. Shed, Shedler property, site, site, land, and house were already de designated as a historic, and we should honor the decision and property use as property use as it was uh, previously accepted um, with um, design um, sports field, not the not the large multi-use uh, field for this. We, shouldn't, we should not overturn previously approved plan, but preserve that property and do not make any changes to that historic place. Please follow the original plan from a few years ago and preserve, please preserve the history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And now we're going to go to our residents who are uh, want to make comments from from uh, public access. And we our first one is Robert Lynch. Are you there, Robert? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So my name is Robert Lynch. I live at 40 Sherwood Road in Ridgewood. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a member of the Ridgewood Lacrosse Association's Board of Trustees. And I'm here to speak on behalf of the families of our uh, over 700 players. Anyone involved uh, with Ridgewood sports, uh, whether you're a parent, coach, an administrator, uh, a member of the Parks and Rec Department, you name it, knows that the town has more kids looking to play sports than we have reliable fields to get them out on. The amount of times that we have to get them out on are limited in the afternoons and the early evenings. Simply put, Ridgewood just needs more fields. Uh, with all the time, effort, and money that has already been allocated to the Shedler property, we have the RLA just implore the council to please just see this decade-plus project over the finish line. The work has largely been done. The money has mostly been spent. It's a, it just seems like it's time to wrap this up and build the field. The, whatever that field is, the, the field just should, get, should be built. Uh, one of the things that I don't like uh, in the discourse of this discussion is when people discount uh, 
and use the term sports teams in some sort of pejorative way in this discussion. The sports teams are simply the children of the families of this community. That's it. So I respect the people of the Shedler community. I respect that they're there as a, you know, as a unified group. But please don't use terms like sports teams in a pejorative sense. They're just the children of the families who live in this town and want to play sports. We need better facilities. When you go to other neighboring towns, and whether you want to call them competing towns or not, towns that we want people people we want to move into and buy our homes and attend our schools, they look at the facilities that are available. Our facilities are we are waning. Other towns are putting in better and better facilities. We just need to take this conversation forward. I trust and thank the council for their time and efforts on this behalf. Uh, we know you guys are facing a lot of important issues, uh, but I do think on behalf of the kids, it's, it's, it's worth putting in there that, uh, that, that we just have a lot of kids and they're looking for a lot of places to play. So this looks like a good opportunity to, to just get this over the finish line. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Robert. Ellie, you're up next. Are you there, Ellie? Hi, hi yes, I had to wait a minute to get unmuted. <clears throat> All good. Thank you for listening. I'm concerned that you're hiring an attorney can you just do your name and address? Hello? Your name, oh, Ellie, and, your name and address, 20, Ellie. 29 South Irving, sorry. Quite all right. I'm concerned that you're hiring an attorney to override concerns by SHPO when you propose a larger field, other outbuildings, which directly impacts the house. How much will this attorney cost? Residents are entitled to a full fiscal accounting. You have had budget hearings where you cut services in the attempt to reduce taxes, yet you see no problem in hiring an attorney, which will no doubt lead to further delays as well as costs to the taxpayer. This will result, as I said, more delays, more yields, years before the fields will be completed. We had a plan, which was ignored by the engineering department and rejected by SHPO. This caused over two more years of delay. Have you considered that by changing the plan that some of the grant money will have to be returned? We've received funding specifically targeted to the original plan. I don't believe you've considered the full implications of your actions. Your actions might cause future lawsuits filed by residents of the East Side who've waited years to see their community center an adequate playing field and trees be completed. This is not good governance. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Next up is Susan. Are you there, Susan? Yes, hello. Good Can evening. Can you hear me? Yes, Hi. name and address, please. Okay. Um, hold on. I'm just looking for something. Uh, my name is Susan Ruan. I live at 705 Kingsbridge Lane. Um, I want to thank the council for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I support a small grass field, playground, walking path, and park to be built at the Shedler property. The large field that was proposed um, by many of the sports people, I know they don't like being called that, but um, will encroach on the historic Shadler House, which SHPO won't allow, and cause a cause delay for um, on the property to ever be completed, which could take years. The large field will also change the character of the property because it will no longer be a park; it will be a field. And although I was told that the village council won't approve permanent lights, what assurance will residents receive? that the Maroons won't move their portable lights to the location, especially since Ridgewood High School has changed their to a later start time and how and that will affect game times. Um, <clears throat> the finish line to Shedler property, I want to correct the sports um, lacrosse person. It was truly the December 7th, 2022 design that the village council, um, the village entered engineer presented and that he worked with SHPO on to have it approved 
and that has been now revamped and discarded. Um, and that was pretty much it. And I also want to know why isn't the village council looking at other places to make it better? Like I know I spoke about citizen because that doesn't require SHPO approval and why they're not exploring that, I'm not certain. Otherwise, because again, when I hear the people speak for who want the Shedler property, they're from the west side and citizen is on the west side. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Next up, Jan. Jan Phillips, 234 Union Street. Thank you for taking my call and thank you for making Pride part of tonight's agenda. Also, thank you for making it or hopefully voting tonight to make Pride an official village sponsored event once again. Um, Pride began after a horrific shooting in, at the Pulse nightclub in 2016. The first flag, a little bit of history, was flown without question by the village manager, Ms. Sonnenfeld and Mayor Aronson. 2017, um, not even a year afterwards, but still in June, CRAB, the Community Relation Advisory Board, continued the practice of flying the flag after the committee was approached by several students and a mom who was a teacher in town. CRAB was a village committee until it became detached. Pride flags continued to fly, faced much criticism, and yet a persistent gathering and planning group continued, always in conjunction with the village, never as a private entity. Two years ago, the former mayor said no more. It would become a private event. Nevertheless, the pride flag flew. We had um, a, a wonderful coming together with the village and with private citizens. The village manager and the mayor facilitated. And as I said, the flag flew. Mayor, when you said pride would be returned to the community about a year ago, or maybe even earlier this year, it's a bit misleading because it's the community, students, civic leaders, and clergy who have always come together and worked with the village. Thank you to the council person who asked about funding because police are on patrol. Um, a speaker flat, uh, I'm sorry, a speaker platform um, in lieu of a celebration similar to that which Glenrock does has not even been decided because the committee has yet to come together has yet to be named or established what's going to happen in terms of a celebration. Police, as I said, are on duty and on patrol. So the question of uh, paying for police should not have even been an issue. We don't ask Signal to pay for Veteran Day services at the NAST. Why would we ask for a pride gathering to consider um, uh, services from Signal to be an added expense. And last, the statement that the public did not want to pay for police, that a private group did not want to pay for police is just misleading. What the group is asking for, what CRAB had asked for, is for village sponsorship, not because it takes less money, as we are the taxpayers, but because it says the village honors diversity and community. And I thank you for really seriously considering this tonight and for your ongoing support. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. Next up, Ankit. Hey, everyone. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that I moved into this under Ankit, Ankit, we can't hear you clearly. If you could speak into your microphone. Can you guys hear me now? Much better. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, thank you, Mayor. So I would like to start off saying that we, me and my, and my family, with my uh, four-year-old daughter, moved into Ridgewood right across the Shedler property. I live at 471 West Saddle River Road. We purchased the house looking at the plan that was approved, uh, I believe, a couple of years ago. Daughter was super excited. She 
and the last mayor basically told us it was going to be ready by spring. My daughter was super, super excited, uh, wanted to, she keeps me asking every day, hey, dad, when's the work going to start? And at this point, all I keep telling her is, hey, daughter, I don't think we're going to get what we're going to get for another few years because of all the plans that are being changed. I would like to see the plan that was approved a couple of years ago with a smaller park with grass and not turf so that our, our kids, everyone, so that it could be sports team, whatever it is. I'm not saying anything that they could come here and enjoy the park as it was designed and uh, let everyone uh, not have any objections. Thank you. Thank you, Ankit. Next up is Lori. Good evening, uh, Lori Weber, 235 South Irving Street. Um, listening, to, uh, listening to the comment by, uh, I think the resident's name was Cynthia, I was previously unaware that there are residents in the Shedler area that rely on their own well water. And I find it astounding that the, as the village struggles to mitigate uh, PFA's contamination of our water supply, that they are contemplating visiting the same issue on the residents in the Shedler neighborhood that rely on that well water. Um, I, I think those residents should band together and consider filing an injunction to stop uh, the placement of a turf field in proximity of their water supply. As far as Pride Day is concerned, uh, I, I believe that the village should sponsor Pride Day festivities, but I also think that they should leave the organization of that event with the LGBTQ community. Suggestions that high school LGBTQ community members would not be considered as full committee members is sh shameful. The straight people need to stop meddling and exploiting Pride Day and leave it in the capable hands of our LGBTQ community members. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. And we have time for one more from our audience. So, Frecha. Frecha De Silva, excuse me, 521 West Saddle River Road. Thank you and good evening. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying two things. Happy International Women's Day. And secondly, um, I am a parent of four kids, two girls who played Ridgewood rugby and two boys who played in Ridgewood soccer, Maroons, and one son who played at the high school. Um, and I know that uh, the Ruins have a daughter who plays soccer, and the Rossies and Joe and Christina have small kids that I'm assuming are gonna play sports. So it's not about community versus sports. Uh, and you know, we hope that um, you know, our fellow, fellow citizens understand that. My comments tonight are about, again, I think I mentioned this before, process and disclosure and transparency. And um, I had several questions I just wanted to, the council to address, and so I wanted to, to bring them up today. Uh, we have seen significant changes on the property at Shetler and uh, want to understand, and I remember the engineer making a statement regarding oversight, want to understand clearly, and maybe it's something we can post on the website, the type of of oversight that's been used to date for archeological, uh, in line with the archeological surveys or the preservation requirements under SHPO. Um, if that kind of oversight, if, if we could get a clear understanding of that, that would be fantastic. And also if there's a plan for the oversight as we continue to develop the property, because it seems to be continuing on on a daily basis. So it would be nice to understand, you know, what process we're following. Um, I believe one of the prior speakers spoke about the retention of counsel. Um, we've seen notices about that. That would be really very helpful to understand uh, the scope of the engagement, um, you know, the, or the terms of the engagement, so that we can understand, like the other speaker, speaker said, um, you know, the intention, the budget, is it a cap fee? Because I know these kinds of issues, being an attorney myself, can kind of go down a rabbit hole, and so want to have a clear understanding of that. Um, and if whether this uh, legal assistance is being engaged uh, with a review of the initial applications, um, it would be nice to understand the goals in connection with that, and does the council have a clear understanding of what steps or process or costs 
are involved in challenging such an application. Um, in determining the plans for the use of the house, I wanted to ask whether the council uh, has explored um, using it consistent with the historical uh, uh, character of the house, explored uh, public grants and foundation, foundations money for using it for historical purpose. And lastly, with regards to demand, I wanted to ask whether, um, I thank you for posting information about the number of teams, but how that information has been applied, uh, the number of players versus the fields, the number of, of games per year versus you know, the number that have been canceled and that kind of information. And it would be interesting to understand a comparison, I know I'm over, of the fields, you know, how far the average field is from a highway, um, you know, the, the exits from homes, et cetera. So thanks very much for the information, but uh, we'd really appreciate more. Thank you. Thank you, Fretia. Um, that's all the time we have for public comment now. There is, of course, public comment at the end of the evening. Um, as, as always, I am very impressed and very grateful that everyone on this, on this, as it was called, hot button issue brings their passion, brings their opinions, and brings their respect to the microphone. Um, this is how we move forward and figure our way through this. So thank you very much. And we will now go to our <coughs> village manager's report. The next council chat will be held on April 1st from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. here in the Village Hall courtroom. Please dial extension 201-670-5500, extension 2207. Walk-ins are welcome. However, reservations have priority. One minute. Okay, um, the Village Council is looking for volunteers <clears throat> for um, Project Pride, which is plantings in the Central Business District, for Green Ridgewood, the Green Team, and Pride Day Committee. Um, on the website, please click on the tile for volunteer opportunities. Send the Citizen Volunteer Leadership Form along with a resume and cover letter and indicating which um, committee you would like to serve on. The deadline is March 17th. <clears throat> Ridgewood 2023 drive through mobile shredding event. There will be no walk-ups. It is Saturday, April 1st, starting at 9 a.m. It ends at 1 p.m. or when the truck is full, whichever is first. The event takes place at Graydon Pool uh, parking lot. Please stay in your vehicle. Um, documents will be securely sh shredded. Um, place the items for shredding in a paper bag or cardboard box only. Uh, there will be no plastic bags, the limited five file size boxes per vehicle. It's free to all Ridgewood residents and businesses only. And the event will take place rain or shine. I do want to report that the old meter poles have been removed from Chestnut Oak and Walnut Streets. Um, the Household Hazardous Waste Collection event is this uh, Saturday, March 11th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Bergen County Utilities Authority in Munaki. They accept various types of um, hazardous waste, such as aerosol cans, antifreeze, batteries, blacktop sealers, all types of paints and varnishes. It's open rain or shine, and there will be no commercial vehicles. On Thursday, March 30th, from 10.30 a.m. to noon, join the Alzheimer's Association Greater New Jersey Chapter, Ridgewood Health Department um, for um, I'm sorry, in the Ridgewood Parks and Recreation Department to learn about the connection between COVID-19 and dementia, as well as receive caregiver tips and resources that can help with legal, medical, and financial matters. In the Annie Susie Youth Lounge, lunch will be provided. The Ridgewood Senior Bus will also be available for transportation by calling 201-670-5500, extension 2203, to make a reservation for the bus. Uh, registration for the event is also being done on uh, Community Pass under the Village of Ridgewood Parks and Recreation page. Village Council upcoming meetings are broadcast live from the ho Village ho Courtroom. It's on the Village website and Channel 34 on Fios, also available on Zoom or by phone and on YouTube. Upcoming meetings are March 22nd is our Village Council work session, April 3rd. This is a change from our usual Wednesday meeting due to Passover. That's a Monday um, at 7.30. April 12th is our Village Council public meeting starting with April 12th 
Our public meetings will begin at 7.30 p.m. like our work sessions. It will, they will no longer begin at 8 p.m. And then April 26th um, is 7.30 p.m. In addition, our next budget meeting will be held on Wednesday, March 15th at 5 p.m. here in the courtroom. It's also on Zoom and by phone. Um, and there, will, there may be additional budget meetings that may have to be um, scheduled so that we can introduce by the end of March and then adopt the budget by the end of April. That's all I have. Thank you, Heather. And then we'll move on to council reports. Evan? Thanks so much. I'll be quick, but I have a couple of things to cover. First, I want to congratulate all the EMS folks that got sworn in. Um, they really represent the best of Ridgewood, and it's, it's – um, yeah, I'll join with Paul, and it's probably one of the highlights of, of having this job is to be able to stand next to those folks as they take the oath. Um, really, really special. Um, also want to encourage folks to show up to council chat. Um, got to sit with the mayor for two hours. Uh, on Saturday, got to meet some citizens. It was a great opportunity to really hear directly from folks. Would really encourage people to think about showing up on Saturdays. I think it's a great way for the council to hear from all of you, um, you know, in, in addition to public comments. Also, Ridgewood Arts Council, we're looking for new more members. If you're interested in joining the Ridgewood Arts Council, please reach out to Heather or myself. Um, we're really looking to revitalize that group. Um, a lot of really interesting things that we have on the agenda, but uh, we just need some more help and some more people. So please think about the Ridgewood Arts Council. Um, also got to sit uh, for the Board of Education liaison meeting. The mayor is going to talk about that, so I'll defer to that. But finally, just want to give a couple updates on the library. They've had a really, really big couple of weeks. Um, the big news is they got a half a million dollar gift from the Library Foundation. Um, really, really amazing um, the Library Foundation is able to do that. Um, it's going to lead to some renovations that are not going to cost the taxpayer anything in, this, in the library. They're going to add a teen space, a private study room. There's going to be some cosmetic updates. Um, really, really, really wonderful, wonderful news from, from the library in that regard. Uh, also look for a new website from the library launching on March 15th. It is ADA accessible. And again, was funded with the New Jersey State Grant. Um, really wonderful that they're getting funding from other sources and, and really enriching all of us here in Ridgewood. A couple of dates coming up, March 11th, uh, Library Con. Uh, if you're into graphic novels, this is your thing. March 15th, Bergen County Mobile Job Center will be at the library. And then March 25th, there will be a present presentation on laser printers um, as well as 3D printing. Really, really interesting stuff that the library is doing. Um, it's, it's just really fantastic to be part of the library and really want to congratulate them on all the great things going on there. Thank you, Evan. Siobhan? Sure. So on um, March 7th, I had both a fields meeting and a parks and recreation meeting, and there was an overlap of discussion on several Is things. Is your microphone on? Mm -hmm. um, so the Master Library continues to be rolled out. They're hoping that both the Board of Ed and the Village will be online and everybody will be planning through official software by the fall season. Um, we had some interesting discussion within fields where several adults showed up, adult organized playing in an over 50 and over 60 league, and they were looking to participate more in organized activities. Um, currently, some of our co-sponsored teams, the youth teams, get preference, and they were looking for expanded hours, and it, it's turned into an interesting discussion about adult play on our fields. Um, both parks and fields had a discussion that was pretty detailed about Shedler, a lot of more of what you've heard of clamoring for fields and the discussion can, from the sports side. On parks, we talk, had a long talk about Graydon, which was great. And in addition to swimming in Graydon, I want everyone to know that Graydon is hiring. Um, so if your teenagers are looking for employment, they pay very well. You can walk there. It's a great place to work. It's a great place to participate. And there's still a you know, shortage of lifeguards across the United States. So Graydon is still hiring. Um, they're looking for all types of activity people for concession, badge checking, everything. I also wanted to highlight that the Parks Department received an award from the New Jersey Recreation and Parks Association. So when you look at some of our communication, in my opinion, the Parks Department is really out there. They're promoting enhanced communication about activities. And thanks to Katie Fry and Nancy Bigos, the Ridgewood's going to be honored for this award. We also discussed um, NOMO May, which I'm not sure if Pam's going to discuss, but NOMO May is rolling out. It's been widely embraced. The website, if you want to participate, will be live soon. Um, I'm assuming tonight after the resolution. 
And uh, this movement came out of Appleton, Wisconsin. And one of the things in addition to fostering no, no mo and the animals and creatures that will grow is that we're hoping that it'll spark conversation within the community. The most interesting thing that I learned was that the optimal time to leave your grass uncut is actually three weeks, but the whole May is to force the exchange. Um, and then lastly, on March 2nd, I took an access road trip um, to meet with a bakery called Rising Above Bakery. They're currently housed in Nyack, and it's a bakery that teaches skills to adult special needs. They, um, they're privately funded, they sell delicious treats, and it was an interesting concept because with the new housing, we have more special needs adults living here who are seeking, on employ uh, seeking employment. At my access committee, I was a little surprised to learn that some of the kids in the community have as little as two hours of work a week. So this was an interesting effort. I went with the head of Speckwire, who runs the annual art show for the special needs. And um, the bakery has a website. It's called Rising Above Bakery. And it was just an interesting trip from access to see, now that we have so many residents living here with special needs, how can we work on fostering more employment for them in a meaningful way? That's it. Thank you, Siobhan. Pam? Well, I didn't get a chance to say it while the EMS workers were here, but I am in awe of these people. They are not just public servants, they're volunteers. And they have day jobs, and in their free time, they do this work that requires bravery, strength, dedication. And um, what really brought it home to me is that during COVID, when we all got to stay home, they had to go out and risk their lives in order to save other people's lives. So it's really pretty mind boggling what they do for our community. Um, also, let's see, I wanted to wish everybody happy International Women's Day. If you know a woman, celebrate her and her work. Uh, the Green Ridgewood Committee met and we are gearing up for the Daffodil Festival and Earth Day Fair for sure. The theme is Ridgewood's Master Plan, a vehicle for change. So if you want to learn about all the things that Ridgewood is doing to improve our environment and our health, do come. You'll learn a lot. And it's a big family event, 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock on April 23rd, and there will be a petting zoo and a swing where the landscaper will hoist your child up into the trees and they love it. And um, for the older kids, there will be a cahoots contest with prizes and uh, the prizes are, well, maybe I shouldn't give that away. Um, <laughs> but you can guess. Uh, let's see, the, the Super Science Saturday was a lot of fun. And again, you don't have to be a child to have fun there. I learned a lot about electricity that I didn't know before. So if you missed it this year, make sure you get there next year. And that's all I have. Thank you, Pam. Um, I was also at Super Science Saturday, and I will tell you that the paper airplane launcher was about the coolest thing I've ever seen. Take that, Elon Musk. Um, and so um, Evan and I met with the Board of Education uh, last week, and so they have some two, thing, two items of significant news. They have finalized the late opening at Ridgewood High School. Um, the, prior, the prior school day went from 7.55 to 2.50, 2.50. It will now begin at 8.20 and end at 3.05, and that will begin in September. Um, one of the uh, other advantages of this is that it will have a better traffic impact on East Ridgewood Avenue because teachers and students will be arriving and leaving at different times. Um, the next piece of significant news they had is that their superintendent search would appear to be over. They have narrowed it down to one candidate. They are now discussing with that candidate um, employment terms and they are optimistic that they will come to terms and that candidate's uh, uh, start date will be July 1st. The announcement will come on March 20th. Um, I also want to take a moment. Um, uh, Evan read the Poison Control Center hotline, and I made a note, because I can't keep my phone up here, that I'm going to put this number in my phone tonight, and I'm going to read it aloud, because it would be a great thing to have this 
when you need it. Hopefully no one ever needs it. But the number for the Poison Control Hotline is 973-339-0702. I'll repeat it. 973-339-0702. If anyone wants me to repeat it again, just let me know. And finally, um, we had a uh, meeting with uh, the Water Department regarding our favorite subject at the Water Department, PFAS. Um, and uh, as everyone here is pretty much aware, uh, we are in the midst of a very large capital project to bring all of our wells through filtration down to undetectable levels. And uh, the issue is that here in New Jersey, we have very stringent guidelines which are very important and we're glad we have them. Much of the country does not have any guidelines at all. However, that could be changing because the EPA is considering issuing PFAS guidelines for all states uh, to uh, what is below the current New Jersey standard. Um, if that happens, uh, much of the country and much of New Jersey that is currently in compliance will no longer be in compliance. However, once we complete our uh, capital project for PFAS remediation, which is uh, projected to be in uh, 2026, I believe the spring, um, we will be in compliance with that new standard. We are ahead of the curve and we will remain ahead of the curve. And that's all I have this evening. So let's move on to our ordinances. We'll begin with Ridgewood Water. I move the first reading of Ordinance 3945. May I have a second? Second. Roll call. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. Vagianos. Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 3945 by title? An ordinance to amend Chapter 145 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood fees at Section 145-6, enumeration of fees relating to code chapters. I move that Ordinance 3945 be adopted on first reading and that April 12th, 2023 be fixed as the date for the hearing thereon. I second the motion. Roll call. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. Vagianos. Yes. I move the clerk read Ordinance 3940 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. In a second. Second. Okay. Perrin. Yes. White. Yes. Winograd. Yes. Adrianos. Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3940? An ordinance to amend Chapter 269 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood Water at Article 4, Irrigation Schedule and Water Emergencies. The public hearing is now open. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Uh, I had spoken about this issue uh, with regard to the smart meters in the summer, and I noted that on January 25th during your work session there was quite a discussion uh, regarding this. Although I appreciate the fact that uh, something has been done in terms of cutting back the number of hours that smart meter or smart water users can uh, operate, I am still concerned that there is no limit in terms of the number of days in which they could operate their system. I am uh, disappointed that Mr. Calvi isn't here tonight, but I see Ms. Fasano is here, and I am still wondering what it is about the smart meters that the water company believes that people who use smart meters should be entitled to water more days per week than those of us who don't have smart meters. And I'm wondering if Ms. Fasano can provide any answers to that question. Uh, I believe that what Rich Calby, oh, right, sorry. Go ahead. Come on up. I think the word you were looking for is controller, boy. Smart controller, thank you very much. And it was uh, Councilwoman Pardon who indicated that her smart controller can be programmed to only water two days per week, whereas Mr. Calby indicated that he was not aware if there were any smart controllers that could be programmed to do so. So again, the issue in, in my view is that people who have smart controllers are entitled now, even by this new ordinance, to water seven days per week. 
there is no limit in terms of the number of days per week they can order. Whereas there are three days per week that no one is supposed to be watering, and those of us who are using manual sprinklers or automatic sprinkler systems are restricted to two days per week. It seems to me to be disparate treatment, and I don't understand why the water company is insisting that people with smart controllers be allowed to water more days per week. What Mr. Calby said is that in a typical summer, they would use less water. But what we had happen last year was that the smart controllers were calling for watering every day because it was so hot out and because it hadn't rained. So during times when there are drought conditions, the smart controllers are putting more water down than the rest of us are putting down. So again, I, I don't understand why, so perhaps the water company can give me some information as to why this should be allowed. Well, I'm not prepared to answer that question. So, um, but I think if you could speak into the microphone. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not prepared to answer the question. I'm Jill Fasano, by the way, Senior Engineer for Ridgewood Water. Um, it's something we can definitely look at, but the, the intent of the smart controllers is to conserve water. I believe, uh, that, I believe that Mr. Calby had said that for a significant percentage of the smart controller users, it is saving water. And, and, and that that was demonstrated in their meter use. Um, and that's why he wanted the controllers to do what they're supposed to do with the seven day a week permission to use them, but on the restricted hours. But he also indicated that when drought conditions existed, he admitted that the smart controllers were putting down more water. So I, again, it, it puzzles me if the smart controller is, is programmed to say when it, the grass needs water, put down water, so when it's hot and dry out, it puts down more water. I, uh, I don't know why you would allow it to water seven days per week. I, I just don't understand that. My other question is that the ordinance is written now, part 269, indicates that smart controllers are allowed to be used on permissible days, but it does not indicate what those permissible days are. For every other type of sprinkler system, manual or automatic, the days that it's permitted to be used are listed in Part 269. Mr. Calby, during the January 25th work session, indicated there would be enforcement. I don't know how summonses could be written if the ordinance does not indicate the number of days in which the controller can be used. It indicates permissible days what are those permissible days and where is that defined? It is not defined in the ordinance at all. It apparently is defined in some manual or some piece of paper in the water department that is associated with the permit for the smart controller. Can you write a summons on that or does it have to be in the code? Again, how do you enforce something that's not in the code? We will. Mr. Rogers, can you comment on that? I'm going to let the mayor speak. And I think the best thing to do is to have Ms. Fasano and Mr. Calby have an opportunity to review this, and we'll have an answer for you at our next meeting. So you're going to defer, you're going to postpone the hearing on this, or what are you going to do about the hearing on this no, ordinance? No, we're going to continue, we're going to continue the hearing. You're going to continue the hearing until the next meeting? No, no, we're going to, we're going to go through with it, but we're going to find, try and find you an answer. But what I think what he's asking is whether or not we're going to continue the hearing to the next meeting while we try to find the answer from Mr. Calby. And if, if the board intends on, if the council intends on voting on this tonight and then getting an answer later. So I think that's what he wants to know. We can defer it to the next meeting. Thank you. I would appreciate that. I appreciate having the answers prior to you voting on, on this. Thank you very much. That's my comments sure. for that. <clears throat> Thank you, Jill. Okay. You're welcome. So let's move on to our resolutions then. No, you need to move that the public hearing be continued oh. to April 12th, 2023. Then, then I, I move that the public hearing be continued until April 12th, 2023. You have a second? Second. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vajianos? Yes. Okay. The following resolutions. 
numbered 23-90 through 23-99 will be adopted by a consent agenda with one vote by the Village Council. Award contract, um, I'm sorry, they will be read by title only. Award contract, gate repairs at Glen Avenue Water Facility. Award sole source contract, furnished corrosion inhibitor. Award contract, ravine PFOS treatment facility. Award contract, under Bergen County contract, water main repairs, materials, and supplies. Award professional services contract, rate expert for 2023 budget and water rates. Award professional services contract, cultural resources surveys for PFOS treatment facilities. Award professional services contract, 2023 water main distribution infrastructure improvements in Glenrock, Ridgewood, and Wyckoff. Award professional services contract, professional engineering services, bid and construction phase, Ames, Cedar Hill, Prospect, and Wharton Dyke facilities. Authorized change order, professional engineering services for various transmission and distribution improvements. Authorized change order, professional engineering services for Ames, Cedar Hill, Wharton Dyke, and Prospect water treatment facility designs. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Perrin. Local. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. I move the first reading of Ordinance 3946. I second. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 3946 by title? Calendar year 2023, ordinance to exceed the municipal budget appropriation limits and to establish a cap bank, NJSA 48 colon 4-45.14. I move that ordinance 3946 be adopted on first reading and that April 12th, 2023 be fixed as the date for the hearing thereon. I second the motion. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. And we are removing Ordinance 3947 from the agenda this evening. It needs some work. But you had a comment on this. That's all right. We'll, Good. Uh, and Matt, will you do that? Yeah, in fact, Thank I'll. You. Yes, we'll take care of it and have it ready for the next meeting. Great. Thank you. I move the first reading of Ordinance 3948. Second. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. Vagianos. Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 3948 by title? An ordinance to amend Chapter 26 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood Green Team at Section 26-2, Purpose, and Section 26-3, Membership, Terms of Office. I move that Ordinance 3948 be adopted on first reading and that April 12th, 2023 be fixed as the date for the hearing thereon. I second the motion. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. I move the first reading of Ordinance 3949. Second. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. So ordered. Will the clerk please read Ordinance 3949 by title? An ordinance to amend Chapter 145 of the Code of the Village of Ridgewood Fees at Section 145-6. Enumeration of fees relating to code chapters. I move that ordinance 3949 be adopted on first reading and that April 12, 2023 be fixed as the date for the hearing thereon. I second the motion. Perrin. Yes. White. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. I move the clerk read ordinance 3941 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Of oh, second. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. Will the, clerk, will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3941? An ordinance to amend Chapter 145 fees of the Village Code for grade and pool membership fees, tennis membership fees. The public hearing is now open. Uh, good evening again, Mayor and Council. Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. Um, the fees seem very much in line with what would, people would typically pay to go to a, a municipal swimming pool. No concern about the fees. Uh, we got a nice bump up in Social Security this past year, so the increase from $30 to $35 for the seniors will work out for us absolutely no problem at all. Uh, what I would like to say, though, is that in 2021, 
no, I'm sorry, in 2022, last year, uh, the council did not raise the fees from what was charged in 2021. And everybody was extremely happy about that until the pool opened and the hours in the pool were severely cut back from what they were in 2021. In other words, in 2021, the, the pool was open from 10 to, to sunset or 10 to 7. But in 2022, because of the difficulty in finding lifeguards, the pool hours were cut significantly. I think they went from 11 to 6. Um, and people were pretty annoyed about that because they had paid their money and then they weren't told until June that the hours were cut back. So I guess what I'm asking now, and I don't see a representative from Parks and Recs here, but the managers here, is how are we doing now in terms of finding lifeguards? Or are people going to pay the increased fees this year and still find out that the pool is not going to be open during the hours it is typically open because there's going to be a shortage of lifeguards? The other thing I would like to mention is that although the hours from the pool were cut back in 2022, those who were on salary, even though they were working fewer hours, their salary was not cut. The hourly people made less, but those who were salaried did not uh, receive a pay cut because the hours were cut back. So I would ask if the manager can give us any information now in terms of how the recruiting is going and might the Graydon patrons expect that there be full hours this year or there's going to be a cutback in hours. So uh, actually the mayor has the report on that. I was actually at the Parks and Rec meeting last night and uh, they've been doing a full court press on this. As a matter of fact, um, at six o'clock tonight they had a job fair um, in the youth lounge. Uh, but they have, uh, they have upped their marketing game significantly and normally around this time they inform me that they have five or six guards signed up. As of today, they have 21 guards signed up. Last year, they peaked at about 24. Their goal is to get to 36. So they are way ahead of the curve from where they are, and we are cautiously optimistic that they will meet or come close to that goal. Thank you very much. That sounds really good. Looking forward to another great season at Graydon, and again, the $5 bump up. Glad that Social Security is going to cover that. Thank you. Thank you, Boyd. Anyone else? Seeing none, I move the public hearing be closed. Second. Perrin. Yes. Whites. Yes. Wendergrad. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. I move that Ordinance 3941 be adopted on the second reading and the final publication as required by law. I second the motion. Perrin. Yes, White. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. I move the clerk read ordinance 3942 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Heron. Yes. White. Yes. Winograd. Yes. And Vagianos. Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of ordinance 3942? An ordinance to amend chapter 3, administration of government. The public hearing is now open. Back again for the last time this evening, Boyd A. Loving, 342 South Irving Street. When this ordinance was discussed, I expressed my concern that some of these signs would wind up on doors that may not necessarily be the right place for the signs. Uh, I was informed that the purpose of the ordinance was to protect records and protect the privacy of employees and the privacy of uh, residents about storing records, keeping people out of places where records were stored. I noted that one of these signs is on the door to the Shedler House. I don't understand why. Just want to point that out to you. There's no records that are being stored in that house. I don't know why one of the signs is on that door I, if the I, purpose of this the record, was about I haven't, seen the, I haven't seen the sign. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's a temporary one just to protect the, the, the facility and also people from entering while the construction is going on. It's so the exact wording in the ordinance that, that I guess it's just coincidental. Well, I don't know if it's coincidental or it was um, if it says restricted area authorized employees only, just the, this, the wording is really not 
um, indicative of any problem with the ordinance or with the access to the house. The wording, well, I, I, re the wording restricts the people because you need to be authorized to be able to go in at this point in time. I, I understand that there should not be anybody in the house but those people who are there. I guess so I guess it's just coincidental that the the wording on that sign is the exact wording that's in the ordinance. Whether it's coincidental or not, there's no problem with having the wording to say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Boyd. Anyone else? I move that the public hearing be closed. Second. Perrin? Yes. Weitz? Yes. Wondergrad? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. I move that Ordinance 3942 be adopted on the second reading and the final publication as required by law. My mic's off. I'm sorry. Perrin. I second the motion. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. I move the clerk read ordinance 3943 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Sorry. Sorry. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. Vagianos? Yes. Will the clerk please read the title of ordinance 3943. An ordinance to amend chapter 156 entitled Food and Food Handling Establishments at Article 8, chapter 156 entitled Outdoor Cafes at section 156-85 entitled Seasonal Operation Duration of License. The public hearing is now open. Seeing no one, I move the public hearing be closed. Second. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. I move that Ordinance 3943 be adopted on the second reading and final publication as required by law. I second. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. <clears throat> I move the clerk read Ordinance 3944 by title on second reading and that the public hearing thereon be opened. Second. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. Will the, clerk, will the clerk please read the title of Ordinance 3944? An ordinance to amend Chapter 156 entitled Food and Food Handling Establishments at Article 8, Chapter 156 entitled Outdoor Cafes at Section 156-80 entitled Property Maintenance. The public hearing is now open. I move that the public hearing be closed. Second. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. Vagianos? Yes. I move that Ordinance 3944 be adopted on second reading and final publication as required by law. I second the motion. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. The following resolutions, number 23-100 through 23-118, will be adopted by a consent agenda with one vote by the Village Council. They will be read by title only. Award contract, automated external defibrillators and accessories. Award contract, materials and supplies, signs for parking and kiosks. Authorized shared services agreement, municipal court administrator and deputy municipal court administrator. Authorized 2022 budget reserve transfers. Increase 2023 deferred school taxes. Request permission for dedication by writer for planting of trees, trust fund. Endorse submission of recycling tonnage grant. Authorize encroachment agreement 22 Maynard Court. Establish waivable policy for end time of village council meetings. Authorize pilot program Chestnut Street and Chestnut Lock kiosks. Establish dates and rates for dining corrals and pedestrian plaza. Establish no mo may. Establish protocol for written comments at hybrid village council meetings. Support legislative bill for open public records act reform. Establish pride day committee. Amend 2023 annual meeting statement. Recognize no bids received and authorize rebid train station coffee bar at the Ridgewood train station. Title 59 approval paving and resurfacing and award of contract paving and resurfacing. May I have a motion? So moved. I second. Perrin? Yes. Whites? Yes. Winograd? Yes. And Vagianos? Yes. We will now return to public comment.
Hi, I'm um, Joe DeMarco, 572 West Saddle River Road. Um, sorry, three minutes goes fast, so I just have uh, one further. Um, and just so you know, you have five minutes. Now. Five minutes. Well, now I don't need five minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to take another minute or so. Um, so I spoke about the issues, the dangers of turf regarding injuries. Just wanted to um, make you aware of a um, study that was done regarding concussions. So um, another startling concern uh, is the apparent risk, increased risk of concussions with the use of artificial turf. A study presented at the 2022 American Academy of Pediatrics National Conference concluded that there is an increased risk of concussion in youth with artificial turf. The study demonstrated the hardness of artificial turf compared to natural grass resulted in a higher rate of deceleration on fall impact, leading to more forceful pediatric athlete head impact with the ground. Previous studies have shown that over 15% of concussions can be attributed to contact with the playing surface. These risks must be considered when making a decision that could lead to a long-term negative impact that affects developing children. As the 10-year-old um, Ridgewood uh, baseball player reminded us last week, sports teaches us important life lessons, like learning how to be a good teammate. I urge you not to forget those valuable uh, team sport, uh, sorry, those values team sports taught us uh, as a kid and to be a good teammate to the residents of the Shetler neighborhood by addressing our concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Jacqueline Hone, 30 Carriage Lane. Um, I just want to make it very clear that this is not a no field argument. This is a field size argument. It's also a call for the village council to do their due diligence when it comes to creating this plan. Field um, is going to create quite an impact as we've heard repeatedly over and over and over again. Um, and so studies are, I would say mandatory, I would say fiduciary obligation, um, I would say is the only thing to do at this point. It was also part of what the ad hoc committee in 2017 asked the village council to do next were the expert independent studies. I've been in communication with New Jersey Historic Preservation Office and they said, I received a copy of a correspondence that they had been having with the village engineer department and I'll read very quickly. The Historic Preservation Office understands, this is Historic Preservation Office to the village engineer, understands that the subject property was purchased to provide recreational facilities to residents in an underserved area of the village. We believe that this goal may be achieved while minimizing the effects on the historic property through a redesign and perhaps scaling back of proposed recreational facilities. We recommend, specifically, we recommend that the village explore moving all of the proposed development to a northern portion of the property with a vegetative buffer, and it goes on and on. And what stood out the most is that it says the historic setting of the Shabrishki Shedler House could be protected and the municipality could achieve its goal of providing recreational space for local residents. So the two things that really stand out to me here is that the property was purchased to provide facilities to, a, to residents in an underserved area. I don't know at what point this became to serve sports, special interest groups. The other very telling thing was recreational space for local residents. In my communication with 
New Jersey Historic Preservation Office, the last thing that they said to me recently was, New Jersey Historic Preservation Office staff will determine whether the proposed park development meets the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. Project that meets the standards are administratively approved by our office. Those that are determined to be encroachments are forwarded to the New Jersey Historic Sites Council for their review, which the engineer here has repeatedly said that most likely what this new council is requesting will have to go in front of the Historic Sites Council for their review. The council is charged with weighing not only the encroachment on the historic property, but also, and in large bullet points, the public benefit of the project. So I don't see how this project is going to benefit the local residents that they had stated in their previous email to the village. Countless hours we've repeated over and over again that it won't be doing that. It's not serving the underserved local residents. Second bullet point was whether or not feasible and prudent alternatives exist. We know that they do. There are other lots, there are other areas, there are other parks. There's a report that states this, that other parks can be expanded, other fields can be expanded, there are other areas, there are other alternatives. Third bullet point, whether or not sufficient measures, measures could be taken to avoid, reduce, or mitigate the encroachment. <clears throat> During the meeting, the applicant presents their project and members of the public have an opportunity to comment on the application as well. So if you don't do the studies, I'm only going to say that we will most likely end up in a big public meeting where sufficient measures were not taken to avoid reduce or mitigate the encroachment. I don't see why we should be put into that situation when there's a plan that we can move forward on that that wouldn't be the case today. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Rorick Hallaby. Uh, one Franklin Avenue. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is the annual report for the Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island, which I'd love to show you. The house sits on 237 acres, the remaining part of Shelter Island that passed down the descendants of Nathaniel Sylvester, a Quaker merchant who bought the island in 1650. Uh, a visit to the manor is a way to quickly feel 500 years of American history. It's an amazing place. From the indigenous people who originally lived there, and many of whom are buried in a mound there, to the English settlers, and with the trade from the Barbados to Shelter Island to England, and to the unfortunate use of slaves to the American Revolution, to the Industrial Revolution, to the present. The manor house and the appurtenant structures are being restored to the tune of $15 million, all of which is being raised from private donations. No public funds are used. Why? To proceed unencumbered with red tape. I urge you to do what you can to get out from under the yoke of Shippo. It's been a disaster. We've just stumbled into it, they've taken control, and we are the losers. Now, <clears throat> I co complimented the mayor on the manner he encouraged comments from across the board, and I really mean it sincerely. Now, I have tried hard to understand some of the concerns of the people who have come out vehemently against what the council is trying to do. So I have a couple of thoughts on their concerns. <clears throat> One, the so-called 2017 plan. The number of times in the last six years we were told 
this was just a conceptual plan, not a final plan. All at once, we're now talking as if it had been cast in stone. It never was. And it's up to you to do what you need to do to serve the needs of Ridgewood in general, not just of the neighborhood, if you will. <clears throat> now, what confuses me is that somehow, in listening to the comments, somehow a smaller field and everything is hunky-dory. But with a lo slightly larger field, like 25 yards longer, we need all sorts of studies done, health and traffic and this and that. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. And also some of the claims are being made about health. I, I, I was looking at a map and talking about particulates and pollution and playing near major highways. I tell you, the playground of Benjamin Franklin Middle School is just as close to Route 17, and it's in a southerly direction, so the wind is from the north, that somehow if people are so concerned about kids developing cancer, kids developing health conditions, playing Chedler, then you should close Benjamin Franklin, the, the, the playing fields. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's either one or the other, if you will. Uh, one last uh, comment. I heard this thing, the fact that some neighbors still use well water, and I urge these people to use filters, and uh, because the idea that anything that you might add to the playing field is going to impact their water, it might do that in about 50 years. What they're being impacted with by are things that were done 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And remember, this was a farming area. In the good old days before precision agriculture and responsible agriculture, people just dumped things on the ground. And you might have some manufacturing companies, etc. So anybody, anybody with a well in that area should use a filter and not worry about what the Shuttler plan might do to them. Thank you. Thank you, Rurik. Good evening. Ann Loving, 342 South Irving Street. So I looked up some definitions of the word obsessive. When a person is obsessive, he or she thinks about something way too much in a way that is not normal. That word normal is from the dictionary definition, by the way, but it certainly has a double entendre with this mayor. A person who is obsessed has lost control over clear thinking about a subject. It is my impression that the mayor, along with Councilwoman Winograd, have become obsessed about building a huge field jammed into a not huge Shedler property. The obsession has become so distorted that attempts are now being made to overturn the established historic status that the state of New Jersey has assigned to both the property and the house. Included in this obsessive behavior is the determination to figure out who approached Shippo about the historic status in the first place. Ms. Winograd referred to it as a whodunit, as if it was some sort of mystery game. As if somehow finding out who approached Shippo could negate the established historic designation. Requests for air quality studies, traffic safety studies, and the like are met with comments such as Councilwoman Winograd said at a recent meeting. She said she was comfortable bypassing these safety measures. In the garden room, downstairs, I have it on tape. We are in a budget crunch, and yet the mayor, along with two or three others is possibly going to hire an attorney at an unspecified expense in an attempt to finagle away to get an artificial rubber field, lights, netting, backstops, bleachers onto this historic property. The council majority is considering purchasing more property to expand the Shedler size during a budget crunch. The mayor has the engineering department working incessantly to find a way to get this baseball field on top of this other field. 
We learned last week that they're no longer allowed to do this in, on overtime. They were doing it on overtime, I guess. Now they're doing it during their regular time, meaning that basically the engineering department can't do their normal work because they're working on the mayor's obsession to find a way to get all these different sports lines on a plastic rug. This is utter financial mismanagement. Please stop. Take a deep breath. A compromise plan is ready to go. Get this obsession under control and take the reasonable approach. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Michelle Italia, 3 Betty Court, Ridgewood. Um, I asked this council to reflect on the previous agreement that was made and that a plan was prepared and the residents of the Shedler area worked diligently with the council, with the attorney, with the engineer, with everyone to come to a plan that would be agreeable and benefit everyone, not just one segment of the community. What this council, I feel, is doing is pinning the people of the, of near the Shedler property with the athletic group and which one is going to win and which one is going to lose after so many years of diligently trying to come to a compromise that would help everyone. And yet, we're back again where we started. I would say that if conversation with members of this council and the athletic group has made you maybe consider, become in a way so sympathetic to the athletic group that you have not thought outside the box. To me, simply saying that the athletic, that the fields are, uh, when we have a disaster, the kids can't play there. It's like Shedler Field becomes the Jesus of the athletic players because now they have a field. Ridgewood has a field where they could all play when this drastic um, problem takes place and they can solve it by putting one field there that's supposed to handle the problem of the whole town. I would ask that maybe this council could look outside the box and could find other areas because there are other areas. You can't expect a part-time coach who does a great job doing his time and working and giving his time and working with the children to solve that. That would be your responsibility. And there are other things that can be done. A child in this room has indicated that there's a possibility. So let's stop wasting taxpayers' money. Let's go on to a plan that was originally made sense and then go on from there and maybe the council can look at other places and stop wasting the money on lawyers, on all this other stuff that you are planning to do and not can finish the project that was agreed upon. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Nobody online? Oh, excuse me. Thank you very much. We have two people online. I, my apologies. Lori, you're up next. 
thank you for not forgetting about me. And uh, th for the thank, uh, <laughs> thank Evan. Um, I wasn't paying attention. I apologize. Uh, it's okay. Uh, Lori Weber, 235 South Irving Street. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate and expand a little uh, again to those uh, people in the Shedler neighborhood whose well water stands to be contaminated by the installation of a turf field in close proximity to their wells, I would urge you not to leave yourselves at the mercy of this council and to be proactive while you can by filing an injunction to stop the village from polluting your well water. Otherwise, in the end, you will not be able to sell your home without installing the appropriate filters at your own expense. And I think that that's, I mean, I, I already know that from people who have gone through this, that would wind up being a necessity. Um, I also just wanted to ask quickly, uh, there was something on the consent agenda that went by real fast, um, something about the council um, supporting a resolute, supporting a bill regarding the Open Public Records Act. Um, I would greatly appreciate it if the council could please explain what that is. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. We're gonna to go to Susan, who is next up on our hybrid access. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I, oh, I thought I... Yes, hi, can you hear me? We can, Susan. Hi, thank you for um, letting me speak again. The, um, Susan Ruan. 705 Kingsbridge Lane. And this is um, just as a reply to the old man's comment about Shedler. Um, I just wanted to clarify that in the 2000 proposal for Shedler, there were studies to be done even with a small field that the um, village engineer had recommended and also the ad hoc committee. Those were never done. so. When he says that it's for the large field that we want these studies, no, it was also for the small field that they were never conducted. Um, next, his comment about BF being very close to the highway is very, very misleading. BF is easily a half mile away from Route 17. And for him to say that it's right beside Lake Shedler is again, very misleading. Um, and third, the water contamination in wells, he says, will take up to 50 years. I bet you those people in East Palestine would love to know how long it took their water to get contaminated from things running into it right now. So when he says 50 years, that's just his ad hoc thought about taking 50 years. That's not scientific. All right. Thank you for your time with this, and thank you for your, um, your time, because it's late. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Next up is Catherine Schmidt. Uh, hello, this is Catherine Schmidt, 123 South Irving Street. I figured I had to join the South Irving Street group. Um, you know, given the characteristics of our village, the charm of our village, the history of our village, um, the wonderful events et cetera, that we have, the cultural aspects to it. I thought that getting historical designation for a space was a gift. I was really excited about it. And it, it surprises me to think that we would want to unravel that gift. I understand that, yes, if we didn't have that historical designation there, you could do other things. But that basically means the other things you want to do are more development. So I just go back to. I think of this as a gift, and it's concerning to think that we would want to shun that gift. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else who has not spoken this evening at, at the late um, public comment? Michelle, you've spoken yes. at the late public comment. You had five minutes. Uh, I'm going to take less. No, 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 we don't take. We don't take. Oh, you didn't take. No, so I'm no, in. We'll I can't take, talk. We'll, I can't you speak. You can come early and you can come late, but you come once at each. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate you respecting that. Anyone else? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. I'd like to say something. 
it is not obsessive to fully examine all the options. It is not obsessive to consider various designs. It is not obsessive to look for a legal path that prior councils never thought of. It's our duty. It's intellectual integrity. Thank you, Pam. Anyone else? Motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. A second. Mm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you.